evening. I'm Sarah Flounders, and I am the host of uh, tonight's Workers' World webinar. I'm a contributing editor to Workers' World newspaper and part of the International Action Center and many anti-military efforts. We want to, tonight with speakers, with videos, with labor resolutions, with fact sheets, and a new book show concrete material to expose and combat U.S. war threats and escalating propaganda against the People's Republic of China. We began with a video, Stop Hate, thanks to Brave New Films, addressing the rise of anti-China racism and hate crimes. Every time the U.S. targets a country, it immediately whips up a racist campaign in the background to create a climate of fear, blanketing the news to silent opposition. Thousands of reports, it's relentless. Trump is doing this in the most vicious way, but Trump is not the first. In this country built on racism, slavery, genocide, it's a fabric of every political act and every war. Racism against black people, all people of color, against migrants. We saw vicious anti-Muslim attacks used for the decades of US wars in the Middle East and Central Asia from Afghanistan to Iraq, Libya, Syria, Sudan, Somalia, and in US support of Israel's war on the Palestinians. Muslims were labeled terrorists, rounded up, deported in mass, disappeared, jailed. We can't forget the tens of thousands of Japanese people were rounded into concentration camps in World War II, but not German or Italian people. That's racism in the US. And what about today? and the COVID-19 pandemic that's hit harder in the United States due to a complete lack of preparation. We're in the midst of a total capitalist economic collapse, a real capitalist collapse. So there's a US failure to protect the population here or to contain the COVID virus, and it's being all diverted into a blame China campaign. Rather than learn from China and what it has done, so successfully. Now, from the earliest days of Workers' World Party, we've been discussing the impact of the Chinese Revolution on the global class struggle. We evaluated China as one of the most thoroughly, thoroughgoing revolutionary upheavals in history, and it impacted profoundly the class struggle in the US and worldwide. And the whole US ruling class was shocked in 1949 with the victory of the Red Army in China. It awakened a world movement across Asia and Africa against colonialism and Western domination. And it was a huge setback for imperialist plans. It was a major question of the Cold War and the 1950s witch hunt in the US. Who lost China? That's how they posed it. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, the efforts to turn back this revolutionary surge for self-determination and sovereignty. And then in 1979, the US capitalist class had a new hope that they could gain a foothold in China through the expanding capitalist market and overturn the huge accomplishment of the Chinese Revolution. But starting with a pivot to Asia, a military realignment under the Obama administration, it reflected a realization that US imperialism's hopes of an overturn were an illusion. China had a strong central government, central planning, and had rapidly developed into the world's second largest economy. It was a historic accomplishment, not only to feed the entire population, but to lift 800 million people out of dire poverty and illiteracy. Today, US rulers from liberals to conservatives, Democrats to Republicans, are united in attacking China and blaming each other for not being harsh or threatening enough. There was a unanimous vote in Congress for new sanctions against China. And we certainly face a dangerous situation today with two nuclear aircraft carrier battle groups, each with accompanying destroyers, frigates, nuclear subs, 70 aircraft, a B-1 supersonic bomber, enforcing freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. 
it's, it's denounced by China as inciting a confrontation. The US wants to return to the days when there were fleets of naval gunboats on the rivers of China, 100 miles inland. That was the US Navy in China before the revolution. The US Navy was there to protect free trade in opium. It's staggering hypocrisy for the US government to claim support of Muslims in Xinjiang when they have spent decades on wars and bombings and invasions and occupations against Muslim people, where they built special jails to jail Muslims from Guantanamo to Bagram. So it's really an effort to rewrite history. And it's all made all more dangerous by the global capitalist economic crash. Now, like clockwork, capitalism crashes. There's a recession or a depression every seven to 10 years for the last 300 years. But this capitalist crash comes with a global pandemic of a new virus, the COVID-19 virus, and that changes everything. While China is building an increasingly coordinated economy based on planning and human needs, in the US, the center of world capitalism, there's decades spent in building the most fabulously expensive military machine in history and a huge repressive apparatus of police and prisons. It's an endless source of profit to the military industries. And yet here, there's no infrastructure in public health, doesn't exist. A child born in Beijing today has a much longer life expectancy than a child born in Chicago or Washington, DC. China's COVID fatalities are under 5,000 people and it's 140,000 fatalities in the US, 3 million testing positive. Why? China used a scientific approach, testing, tracking, huge supplies of essential materials, and a social mobilization of the entire population. In the US, no public action, no social mobilization, no necessary materials in place, just complete incompetence and disarray. So of resorting to blame China and raw anti-communism. And even worse, there's the use of the capitalist crash and the COVID global shutdown, not for cooperation, but to intensify sanctions, a weapon of shortages and economic crisis, and in a time when countries are the most vulnerable. But the more the US imposes sanctions on countries, China has established trade and aid toward Venezuela, Iran, Syria, Cuba, throughout Africa. It's impacting the entire world order from the way that US imperialism wants to run things. Here, everything, everything, first, foremost, and always is, does it make a profit? So tonight, we say, it's not democracy in Hong Kong to finance, train, and organize destruction, uh, disruptions, and it's not human rights to vote sanctions on China or 39 other targeted countries globally, a third of the world population. And it's not freedom of navigation or freedom of trade to bring aircraft carriers and missile batteries to surround China. Just like it's not about police in the US being for protection of our communities. We have to tear down these racist myths. We hope to do that in this program because we need to build unity among all the forces that are challenging US corporate lies and threats. We may not agree on every point on the complex social development in China and even its class character. But I think we can all agree that US imperialism is not ever a force for liberation or for human progress. So this is really just the opening of our program. I, it's really an honor to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Monica Moorhead, 
who is the editor, managing editor of Workers World newspaper. She's been a commentator on many past uh, webinars here and uh, really frames this in a way I think that would be very helpful. So, Monica. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, and good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we are discussing U.S. imperialism's growing threats against People's China, a revolution that has changed world history. Imperialism's strategy from the first day was how to overturn this revolution. China has grown in, in its ability to not only feed its entire people and provide housing and health care and stability. It has developed enorm enormously. It is now a major world economic power. This accomplishment is a threat to the imperialist Western corporate rulers, especially here in the US. To understand the relationship between imperial US imperialism and China, one must understand imperialism as an economic system, not as a policy. One of the five basic features Vladimir Lenin laid out in his 1916 Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism book was completion of the territorial division of the whole world among the biggest capitalist powers. China was ruled with an iron fist as a colony by both Britain and Japan before its socialist revolution in 1949. Imperialism is capitalism at that stage of development at which the dominance of monopolies and finance capital is established. In the 1968 pamphlet, Expanding Empire, Workers' World Party founding member Vince Copeland states, and I quote, the investment of capital in a foreign country should be regarded somewhat like, a, like sending a huge suction pump there, which pulls out the metals from the ground, the products from the soil, and the fruits from the trees, with the help, of course, of the labor of the quote unquote, native people or workers working on this suction pump. It is as if the pump were connected to pipes that run back to the home or the capitalist country via the banks and big corporations. All the rich products are showered from the pipes into the treasuries of these institutions in the form of profits. Whole nations are drained by these great suction pumps or investments. And the profits are so great that rival groups of big business led by small cliques of big banks go to war with each other over the exploitation of these nations." End quote. Both Lenin and Copeland over a span of 50 years were describing the same imperialism as rich capitalist countries getting richer off the systemic underdevelopment of the oppressed nations that get poor through the debt crisis, war, sanctions, and occupation. There are oppressed nations within the US of black, brown, and indigenous people who are disproportionately poor compared to the whites. There is imperial, therefore imperialism has created a war at home and abroad. This super exploitation is the economic basis for countries in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, the Middle East, and oppressed nations at home having the right to sovereignty or self-determination that is to determine on how best to develop their economies, societies, and communities to meet the basic and cultural needs of their population without the bullying interference of the corporate bosses and militarism 
This is the basis upon, upon which China must be defended against imperialism. The COVID-19 pandemic ripped off the band-aid of this cancerous, monstrous system, which has left billions more workers and oppressed people on a global scale, so vulnerable to suffering and deaths due to a lack of health care, food, shelter, clean water, the right to a job or income, and more, including right here in the belly of the beast. And hunger is predicted to take more lives during the pandemic on a global scale. And we must really be vigilant when it comes to the mass evictions that are, that are to come in the millions by the end of next month. Now the whole world can see that the U.S. is incapable of protecting its own uh, population. There is no public health system compared to China's huge public health system for more than a billion people. U.S. infrastructure is crumbling while corporate profits are soaring. Meanwhile, the U.S. has nothing to offer the people of the world except for terrorist threats and more suffering. These weaknesses make the U.S. more dangerous than at any time in its history because it is, it is a desperate, dying system in permanent crisis whose profits are based on militarism and war. We are in the midst of a global capitalist economic crisis and a global health pandemic. Millions of angry youth of all nationalities are on the move challenging this white supremacist system, especially police brutality, in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. It is a perfect storm. U.S. rulers are united in wanting to turn this anger, this economic pain, and this fear of virus into blame, a blame China campaign as Sarah opened up with. And we say no. Intensifying the class struggle inside the United States is the most effective method for socialists and revolutionaries here to show political solidarity for oppressed peoples and workers inside and outside these artificial borders whose only so-called crimes have been to fight for economic independence and political equality by any means necessary. And China is an example of fighting for its right to sovereignty and self-determination. With no other options, countries have and more will turn towards socialist reconstruction and equitable trade as the only answer to imperialist underdevelopment. Our solidarity and our determined opposition to US sanctions and war threats, starting with China, can have a huge, tremendous impact. Build a worker's world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, and we'd next like to invite Su Hin Lee, who is with the China-U.S. Solidarity Network and the National Immigrant Solidarity Network. I traveled with uh, Su Hin Lee uh, to China for the 70th anniversary of the Chinese Revolution, an incredible celebration, an incredible experience. Uh, for many years, Su Hin Lee has been an activist with migrant and undocumented workers, along with doing China solidarity work, originally from Hong Kong. Su Hin Lee, hello. Hi, uh, can you, you, you turn to, on my... You need to turn on your video. Your I did, on. okay. Uh, I, now I, I, I will turn on. There good. you go, okay. Good. Hi everyone, my name is Su Hin. To talk about, uh, Sarah had talked a lot about what is this situation. I want to be a little more in depth to talk about the whole pictures. Right now what happened is not just a 
COVID, it's also need to see the broader picture, what happened between China and the US and the global situations. Sarah said, uh, we organized a, a delegation last October to go to China to witness the 70th anniversary of founding foundation of People's Republic of China, but also we organized another delegation on December to January to went to Silk Road, to went to Xinjiang and I meet with many activists. We know something is going to happen. We know that's going to be a, have a heightened tensions between China and the US. That time still don't have uh, COVID, but that has a several major escalation, include the so-called trade war, the US involvement, COVID action, the so-called revolution in Hong Kong, my hometown, also, the U.S. military naval ships has been sailing and close to the South China Sea and near the Chinese coast, as well as Huawei and all these uh, uh, so-called bogus China spy allegation in the U.S. So December last year was a very tense moment that all these things piling up against China. But China successfully fought most of them. That was the uh, end of the December when we were in, in, in uh, Xinjiang and then uh, meet, with, uh, we, meet with many people and talk about because we worry about that maybe US is going to launch something in China from maybe a protest to all these kind of political things because US has been pushing for some several Less solutions such as Uyghur human rights, so called Uyghur human rights acts, pushing the Hong Kong uh, legislation, etc. At the end of the delegation, I would say uh, around January 2nd, 3rd this year, we start hearing the story about there's uh, uh, some kind of uh, virus broke out in Wuhan. And uh, there was starts then uh, people are start worrying about and the government start warning everyone to be start preparing and uh, to be uh, careful about uh, uh, health and safety. And I was staying in China until January 20th when the situation getting worse and worse and worse. But I also have the opportunity to witness what China has done to fight against uh, the pandemic and mobilize the national population, not uh, everyone to be involved in the so-called the people's war against the virus. So this is not a simply speaking that uh, is a, China can win the beat back the COVID within two months is a luck. It's a really talking about a socialism under China's characteristics that able to mobilize national capacity to fight against the, 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 the virus that no one heard about. That's also the reason why U.S. fell, because U.S. has been obsessed with against China, the China bashing, and then also the Cold War against China. That's the reason why that's, uh, uh, all this uh, Trump is uh, so furious, because he definitely lost. That's the one of the reasons why he had been so furious against the World Health Organization, accusing them there's a proxy of China, which is completely bogus, not true. But on the same time, that also been spreading all this uh, uh, unfounded hoax about so-called the Wuhan military lab virus. Because what is it got to understand, this is not just talking about blaming China, the virus, but also to want to, this is a whole thing, is a want to contain and against China, the hopefully that this can be become a so uh, at the beginning, if you remember, people had, uh, the right wing Republicans, or even some media have been calling this a China's Chernobyl. Hopefully that will become a disaster and that will be a national 
disaster that will be China cannot handle. And then at the end, people are angry, uprising, overthrowing the government. Then the U.S. can be victorious. Just like the mentality, what that time, from Trump to right-wing Republican, it's just like a, a losing gambler, desperately looking for some way to turn the back turn the table back against China that can be victorious. That is a pawn talk. That is a Cold War mentality. That is a racism. That's with any cost they want against China, the success. Right now, US, the COVID has been completely dysfunctional, the response is dysfunctional, and also has been failed. The next fight will be the uh, vaccine, the so-called vaccine. China under socialism, able to mobilize national effort to not just combat virus, but also to organize, to, to develop vaccines. Just to make it simple, stay saying right now, there's total 17 vaccines on the clinical trial. China already has in total nine, compared with US is four. So, China is right now have several are very promising compared with US, but could be ready by end next year. That's what exactly US don't want to be seen. Why that's very simple, imperialism and capitalism. Imperialism, what that mean? If China can develop a vaccine, can be safely used, can be ready available, China already promised that will be available will free the, the, the intellectual property, will be free to every country. That means that China will be leading the way on, on fighting the virus, not the US. That's exactly what US doesn't want to see, besides the money the US can make. And then they thought that this is the money supposed to be US make, not other country. So I appeal to everyone, this is not a, uh, just like talking about it's only a virus fight but also it's a struggle, international solidarity. Also international solidarity against US imperialism from China to Africa, to Middle East, to Latin Americas, everywhere that has been devastated tens, hundreds of millions, billions of people. If we can unite, we can win the struggle, not only COVID fight, but just social justice and economic justice. What we saw on the Black Lives Matter movement, we have been, if we can unify, we, we can work together, we can succeed, we can accomplish something. Right now, we are working with Sarah and uh, developing a book. We just thought about it two months ago, we should write a book about why China successfully fight the COVID and why US failed. We can talk about that a little bit later, but I hope that books and that our discussions can enlighten people, learn something new that why, what we can learn from China and then why is international solidarity is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suhin. And uh, yes, we look forward, we're gonna hear more about this book, so stay tuned. Uh, I think it will be a real contribution uh, to the discussion uh, and, and very informative. Um, people all over the country, it has a wide range of, of uh, writers. So next, we would like to call on Calvin uh, Dushbien, uh, who is an activist with uh, International Action Center, and he has prepared a very effective uh, fact sheet. So, uh, Calvin, and um, and and Suhin, turn off your camera, and uh, I also will turn off mine. Okay. So, All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, and and thank you, thank you, everyone else this evening. Uh, my name is Calvin Deutschwein. I'm with the International Action Center, and I prefer they or any pronouns. Uh, I've been having a lot of conversations about COVID-19 and especially the U.S. response with members of my family and my union. And I decided to create a fact sheet on why we should adopt successful tactics seen in China 
And now I get an opportunity to share them tonight with all of you lovely people. So I, I really appreciate that. You can hear my cat meowing yeah, in the background. This is the first time she's been talking in two hours. Um, the facts on this are, are pretty stark. Just look at the numbers of confirmed cases, which is um, a likely undercount in the US. That's, that's my dear cat, I'm sorry. Um, this is a likely undercount in the US. We know in the US there's a, uh, a testing shortage. There's been testing shortages at, at all points in time. Uh, the US has been underreporting on the virus. And even in this case, the US has twice as many cases as Brazil or the European Union, including Britain, which are sort of the next two largest outbreaks, uh, many times more than Iran and far, far more than China. This is not getting better. Uh, the U.S. is adding more new cases per day than the next two worst uh, nation state outbreaks combined, which are India, which of course is basically the most populous nation in the world tied with China, and Brazil, where the outbreak is also very severe. Uh, when I looked at this uh, on this day, which was July 4th, there were four new cases in the entirety of the People's Republic of China. If, like me, uh, you're someone who lost access to their health care around the same time that a state of emergency was declared in your home state, these numbers should be no surprise to you. Healthcare access in the United States is extremely difficult. Uh, only 41% of Americans have the material resources to just afford to go to the emergency room and begin treatment. And this lack of access pervades the healthcare system and its for-profit origins from top to bottom. Of course, this could be resolved with international aid, but the United States has also been, I realize I'm covering up part of this slide. Okay, the US has also refused international aid. Early on in the, the coronavirus pandemic, there was a lot of discussions around this World Health Organization test and the United States refused that and decided to use a test that didn't work, that was made by friends of the president's family. And as a result, we had no real control over the virus. This results in an enormous difference of outcomes. And these are the, the graphs of the new cases per day beginning after the first confirmed death in the US and China. The only reason you can even see the line in China on this graph is because we're not controlling for population. There is this little tiny bump right under the N and the A in the China, which is a one pixel high bump, and that was referred to in Western media as the Beijing outbreak. Um, as you can see at that same time, that was right around the time the US was hitting 2 million uh, total cases, and now we're up to 3 million cases, and once again, cases are increasing exponentially across the world. Sorry, across, across the states in the US. These, um, let's see, I'm gonna try and get that to go away. These outbreak conditions are the direct result of the style of governance in the US, which prioritizes the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, basically the health of the stock market over human lives. You can see over the course of the coronavirus outbreak that the Dow Jones was increasing as the coronavirus outbreak was becoming more severe. Even in the cases where this splits, uh, such as right under the word, the E in the word explodes, um, where there's a very high Dow Jones, and this is a case of a lower uh, coronavirus average, this was during the big reopening push, and the stock market was anticipating in two weeks there was going to be an additional outbreak of the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic in the US. We understand what it takes. You know, I was eagerly watching China defeat this virus, make it look easy, frankly, despite the level of national mobilization. The only solution is the socialist control of state power. The entire program of emergency disease control and the Chinese response was rooted in the robust communal programs from the communist revolution that allowed a city, Wuhan, which is larger than the state I live in of North Carolina, to sustain a lockdown for two and a half months until the virus stopped spreading entirely. This is not what's happened in the US. As Sarah mentioned in earlier slides, the US has spent many of the most productive resources in the world all preparing for war with China, all inciting Sinophobic attacks against Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the US. As it stands in the US, we now must oppose both the white nationalist pandemic mismanagement 
and the imperialist ventures against China. And I'm grateful for the International Action Center and Workers' World Party for doing so. Just for like a little final note from me, we do have these resources available at the International Action Center. Um, this is a slide deck I created, and you see on the last slide we have here a separate fact sheet. And then we also have a lot of other fact sheets. You can check them out at iacenter.org. Uh, here's one on the U.S. role in the Hong Kong protests, which can provide some additional context behind these conversations we're having about U.S. imperialism and the ambitious socialist project of the People's Republic of China. So thank you so much. I'm going to figure out how to click all these buttons in Zoom and get out of here. Thank you so much, Calvin. It, it does show it's so important to just provide the concrete facts and a context, and a context. Uh, so thank you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Sharat Lin. He, uh, Dr. Sharat Lin is with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. As a researcher, he writes and lectures on global political economy, labor, migration, Middle East, South Asia, and public health. Uh, he's been studying firsthand the historic transformation of China from the Cultural Revolution to the present. So, uh, Dr. Lin, please join us. Okay, I'm trying to turn on the video here. Can, can uh, the host please turn on my video? Hmm. Okay, there we go. Okay. okay. Well, th thank you to the uh, to the Workers World Party and International Action Center for for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Um, I want to first of all, um, you know, frame why the United States is is taking this very increasingly aggressive approach towards China, and I, I think that some of the other speakers have already have already uh, you know touched on this. And U.S. capital is, is facing a challenge from, from the, uh, the Chinese economy and, and the fact that, that China has, has seen an amazing growth rate, an amazing uh, development of its own internal infrastructure, uh, and has become you know, the, by far the, the leading uh, exporter of, of industrial goods to the rest of the world. Uh, sometimes called the factory of the China is the factory of the world, and and that in the in the long run, of course, you know, threatens U.S. supremacy. And the, the United States is a leader only in in the military, in the sense that the United States still spends nearly fifty percent of all dollars in the world on 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 the military. Uh, meanwhile, the the Chinese economy, if if is right now, it stands at about. Fifteen trillion dollars in GDP versus the U.S. at about twenty-two, and if you look at it in, in actual purchasing power parity terms, uh, the, the Chinese economy is actually the world's largest economy, and um, so that that has long-term implications in terms of the the uh, ability of, of of China to to weather, um, you know. Conflict between the, between the China and the U.S. Um, in terms of being able to uh, provide an alternative uh, uh, center of power uh, in the world. On top of that, the, this conflict between U.S. capital and and the rising China is the fact that we have a president right now who is um, reversing the the globalization. Whatever you think of globalization, the point is that is that Mr. Trump is um, uh, exercising a lot of ultranationalist uh, rhetoric and and actions in terms of pulling out of treaties, imposing sanctions, and and doing all of these these kinds of uh, of aggressive uh, moves um, that are that are extra economic in the sense that they are they are not market driven measures and um, he's doing that because because he wants to because of his own failure because of the failure of the United States to to combat the covid nineteen 
uh, failure to to um, you know maintain its industrial base, failure of the U.S. to have a national health care system, housing for everyone, and so on. And so the way is to is to scapegoat another country, and and certainly that included in that would be the world's uh, rising power. Um, and and if you look at, at China, you know it's it, it's it's a uh, I have a more nuanced picture of of China because it is while it does have a a socialist oriented government, uh, it is a it is also you know sixty percent of the economy is is essentially capitalist, and uh, and that and that sector continues to grow, um, but. But China, for example, does still have a, for example, right now it has a, it has made a national commitment to to reduce poverty to zero. I mean, of course, they have a certain definition, and many people would would dispute that definition. But the point is, there is a national program, which is just which is targeted to to finish by the end of this year, and according to their definition, to reduce poverty in the country to zero by the end of of this year. Um, the U.S. uses all kinds of of, of means to to um, to demonize other countries, and one of them is human rights. So every year, the the State Department produces a report to the president on human rights, and the executive branch, the the White House, basically uses that selectively to to target countries. I mean, the, the, there's a section there on Saudi Arabia, but the the administration never raises the points about human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia, but they do in, in China. I, I was just in, in Xinjiang and, and I had a first-hand chance to, to see what is really going on there. And I see that you know, it's not a question of, of repression. Yes, there's a, there's a heavy police presence. The, the actual number of, of um, new uh, Imprisonments, which is in response to a very, very tangible uh, terrorist threat um, that that you know a lot of the the Uyghur fighters have been uh, have been found in in Syria, um, along with the fighting with the jihadis, and the actual number, according to to China's own official uh, incarceration figures, they have risen over the past. Um, five, five to seven years, by a factor of about two hundred thousand in Xinjiang. It's an extraordinary number, but it's not the one million or two million that is sometimes cited in in the, by U.S. government figures or by the media, without any documentation of of how they get those those kind of figures. So, uh, so the, the the human rights issue is 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 uh, is used very selectively when. The U.S. wants to 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 target another country or attack another country. The Huawei uh, uh, case, uh, Huawei is is China's leading telecom uh, and mobile phone manufacturer, and um, it's been targeted because because of allegations that that it will um, because of its being being a Chinese company that that it will compromise security. Of uh, telecoms in you know wherever Huawei equipment is 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 used. Now no one's ever proven that, but you know one has to be reminded that that every U.S. manufacturer is is required and some and there is resistance, but they're required to build a backdoor for the FBI to to uh, to spy uh, through through U.S. equipment. So it's it's not really any different with the U.S. and I don't think that, that Huawei is any different. Because Huawei is not a state-owned company; it's actually it's actually owned by the employees, at least officially. Um, and um, so there there are a lot of this this bashing is is artificial. Um, China is not perfect; it's it's not uh, a, you know a a, a, a an ideal uh, socialist country, but um, but a lot of this bashing is is because of uh, imperialism's uh, own failure 
and and it's it's a desperate attempts to to remain the the sole um, superpower in the world, a position from which it it can dominate and 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 impose its will on the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherat. And uh, we next want to move to uh, Dave Welsh, who is a delegate to the San Francisco uh, Labor Council. Dave is a retired postal worker. He has decades as a labor activist. And uh, just this week, he was able to uh, introduce a very important uh, resolution, labor resolution. Uh, to the council. And uh, Dave, if you would tell us um, about that, that would be that would be great. So Dave Welsh. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Yes, we have a we have a meeting uh, once a month of the Labor Council and the delegates from the different unions represented by the Labor Council come together and vote on various things. And last Monday, we had a meeting uh, uh, with about 75 participants from the different unions. And uh, I was there representing the letter carriers, the people who deliver your mail. And uh, we discussed this, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, the attacks on China being launched by the President of the United States, Mr. Trump, and supported uh, to some degree, to quite a, quite a degree by the Democrats. I mean, the, uh, the, the Congress, the Democrats, as well as the Republicans voted to heighten sanctions against China. This is, uh, this is crazy. I mean, the, this is an interdependent world where how another economy develops affects our country and affects our workers and affects our consumers. And uh, let me talk a little bit about the resolution. And, and that is that uh, the, the resolution says that the so-called Pivot to Asia uh, Act of, of 2011 was in fact a pivot toward war and confrontation that identified China as a competitor and an adversary, carrying with it the threat, the US threat of nuclear war against China. And then the resolution goes on to say this dangerous policy has created palpable feelings of fear, animosity, and even hatred, not only towards the People's Republic of China, but towards Chinese people in general, and Chinese American citizens, and other Asian peoples in the United States. And you know, that, that means we have to go back to uh, the Second World War when the United States and Japan uh, were at war in the, in the Pacific Theater, and uh, uh, the United States, uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, the President of the United States, rounded up Japanese Americans in the continental United States and, uh, and put them in concentration camp for the duration of the war. I mean, this was outrageous. Basically, the, the Japanese American uh, citizens had their land stolen, they were deprived of livelihood, and they were cooped up with their families in these uh, barbed wire camps. Well, even right now, you see a resurgence of this kind of thing against Chinese Americans as people try to scapegoat China for the COVID uh, outbreak. Now, when you look at the, the, the China has had uh, something like uh, 4,500. The United States has had hundreds of thousands of deaths from COVID. From COVID. So uh, China moved rapidly to limit the damage and to stop the spread of the virus. The United States has not done so. Now, one of the reasons for that could be uh, what jumps to my mind is that China has a socialist system and they can mobilize uh, to uh, to protect the people from a, a real danger to their health and livelihoods, and uh, and they did it. They used the power of the uh, of the government of of China to uh, 
uh, isolate the virus and to protect people so it would stop spreading. That's what we need to do. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the resolution uh, goes on to say that the dangerous policy started with the pivot to Asia of 2011 has created palpable feelings of fear, animosity, and even hatred toward the People's Republic of China and towards Chinese people in general and others of Asian descent in the United States. And the resolution goes on to say that humanity now faces multiple crises that threaten the well-being and very survival of our species. Crises which demand the cooperation of the two largest and most powerful countries, China and the United States. Now, why is it that when the United States starts to have a serious economic crisis, uh, the first reaction of the political leadership of the two major parties seems to be to prepare for war? Uh, this is not a rational way of dealing with things. We need cooperation. We need peace to deal with this issue like the, the COVID epidemic. And uh, uh, anyway, the the Labor Council, you know, I say San Francisco Labor Council, everybody may not know exactly what a Labor Council is. It represents, uh, there are certain, uh, maybe four or five delegates from my branch that uh, represents the letter carriers that deliver the mail. And uh, we go there and we meet once a month in the uh, plumber's hall in San Francisco and discuss these issues that affect organized labor in the United States. And the San Francisco Labor Council has taken the lead on many issues, like arguing against the Iraq war, the war against Iraq, uh, arguing against uh, the preparations for war against Iran. And the, the Labor Council has taken positions counter to that. I said, wait a minute now, who's going to be fighting those wars? The workers of the United States, our members and their children, are going to be the ones fighting this war, and so therefore we have to oppose it. This is a this is a labor issue. If you're going to be sending my son and my daughter off to some place uh, thousands of miles from where we live, uh, and and to fight a war with some other country, this is not rational. This does not make any sense. And uh, and I think of eventually I think we can prevail. Uh, so the the resolution concluded that uh, urging the government of the United States to reject escalation towards global conflict and instead pursue peace, non-intervention, and cooperation with China and the rest of the world. You know that the working class that I'm part of, uh, we don't want to go to war. We don't want to go and subject our bodies, the bodies of our children, our neighbors, uh, to uh, to these terrible. I mean, a lot of a lot of veterans are are in our labor council, people who survived these vicious wars, and came back maybe not all in one piece, but with most of their pieces still intact. So I think uh, uh, the labor council, speaking for organized labor, but also for the unorganized part of the working class, which is the larger part, uh, say, look, we don't need this war. We don't need to be sending two different battle groups of aircraft carriers and offensive weapons, including nuclear armed weapons, into the South China Sea. What, how would we feel if China or some other country came and uh, up and down the coast of California, uh, up and down the coast of uh, the East Coast, uh, the Carolinas, or New York, uh, brought in weapons of of, of, of war, meth weapons of mass destruction. This is not something that we need. We need peace in order to develop, uh, 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 to develop in a in a way that's going to benefit our children, our neighbors, our friends, and loved ones. And I, I think this is a totally unnecessary, but you know, it flows from the way the capital system is organized. There, especially the United States, which is doing 
and not so well economically. They're not doing so well. This is a this COVID-19 epidemic has uh, has greatly hurt the ability of the United States economy to uh, to produce what it needs and to employ people. You know the millions of people who've been thrown onto the un roles of unemployed and who have been laid off from their jobs and it hasn't even begun yet. This is something very serious and we need the cooperation of the government of China and many other countries around the world. We don't need to be hostile. We should be friendly with the world. That's what people want. People want to be able to bring their families up and develop themselves and develop uh, the, the uh, cultural life of the country uh, in peace. Is that so hard? I mean, that's what we need. We need peace so we can all get along. That's what we need. That's why we need to have some socialism because uh, this system we've got now is such a warlike system. And when it gets in trouble, it starts building the bombs. That's what's happening. And uh, the San Francisco Labor Council is, I believe, to my best of my knowledge, is the first labor organization to come out against, uh, against uh, the building war against China and other countries. And the, the resolution uh, says it all when it says, we need a pivot to peace with China and the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. And I, I think that's a great example. Uh, you'll need to turn off your video and sound. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to take um, questions to the panel. So I want to encourage everyone to, if you have a question, we, there's no way we can answer all the questions that have come in. Uh, but we'll try to choose uh, a few things to focus on. Um, and uh, really uh, kind of deal with them in this discussion. Uh, we want to also go through upcoming webinars that are happening uh, and kind of focus on that too. So uh, let me just say before that, I guess we'll take this as a station break uh, because having resources is extremely important. People want to know where they can go to find facts and information uh, and uh, along with encouraging you to really uh, look at workers.org, uh, I want to first mention the Chow Collective. Uh, that's chowcollective.com. They also have a Facebook site. And it is a collective of diaspora Chinese challenging U.S. aggression on China. And they say that they, their aim is to challenge U.S. rise in aggression toward People's Republic of China and to be a bridge between the U.S. left, particularly the Chinese diaspora left, and China's rich Marxist, anti-imperialist, historical, and contemporary political work and thought. And to build a movement of leftists determined to push back against the U.S. increasing aggression against China. Uh, to critically consider the current role of China and socialism with Chinese characteristics in contemporary uh, geopolitics, and to disrupt Western misinformation and propaganda. So that's a good site to look uh, to also, and I would recommend it. Uh, I want to say that there is um, another webinar coming up. Uh, uh, it's an international webinar, and, and so you can be on it almost it's depending on what hour around the, uh, the, the clock, but called nocoldwar.org. Uh, it's an international China webinar with a number of speakers, uh, and it will, there will be other ones held in the future also. So this is the first one uh, on this focus, uh, and again, seeking to answer and provide resources and information uh, on China and this growing uh, US instigated uh, conflict. Uh, we want to support the efforts of the Pivot to Peace. Uh, we have also, I see the next screen that's up. Uh, there's a, a video called Hong Kong Follow the Money. 
and we want to thank the Peace Report on that. It's had more than 150,000 views on YouTube, and it goes through some of the history of China and the U.S. funding through the National Endowment for Democracy. So uh, that video and many other videos, which we list on uh, you know workers.org, you can check. Uh, I want to also uh, announce. Uh, just before we, we go to that, that on August 6th, a Veterans for Peace is having a, an online convention, and part of it is a China webinar uh, on the pivot to peace. So you might want to tune in to veteransforpeace.org to check out that webinar. And all of this is to say that there is just a wealth of information out there. Uh, I want to next encourage you to really check out join Workers World if you want uh, to be in the struggle uh, and to fill out a form online, we'll get back to you uh, because it is a political struggle. It's a struggle in the streets here. As we know, the last two months have been intense uh, against the police, the, man, the demands to abolish the police, abolish the Pentagon. It goes hand in hand and it takes a people's movement. Uh, so fill out that form and uh, at least if you want to hear from us. If you want to get daily news updates, then uh, fill out another form and that is to uh, get uh, uh, articles from Workers World on a daily basis by email. Uh, you can subscribe and you can unsubscribe at any time, uh, but it's a good source of information and we link to other groups all the time. Uh, whose work is, we think, uh, important and in line with uh, what we're doing. Uh, and there's one final thing, because we do live in a capitalist society, and everything, everything costs money, uh, even though we're an all-volunteer organization. But donating just these webinars, the online work, everything in print costs a great deal of money. So if you can donate, you can do so at Venmo, at Workers World or on the website workers.org donate or at, on the patreon.com slash WWP donations to the Patreon go to help our subscriptions to prisoners. A third of our subscription list was for uh, those incarcerated. Uh, this is really part of the working class, our class here, and we want to show specially um, support so at any rate, those are some things that you can do. Uh, and we're going to um, just move to a few of the questions. We, we did promise also uh, Suhin Lee there would be time to uh, describe this book. So why don't we go to that while we look at the questions that have come up um, and, and ask uh, you, Suhin, to describe uh, this book project, because that, I think, is another thing that uh, is, is, uh, will be an important resource. That's what we're really seeking to do. How do we uh, defeat uh, this propaganda? And we got to do so with, with facts and counter it. Okay, Suhin. Yes, thank you, Sala. Uh, I, uh, the, the book is going, we are almost finished the book and its title is called Capitalism on a Ventilator impact of COVID-19 in China versus U.S. It's a joint project with our organization, China-U.S. Solidarity Network, with International Action Center. We, the, uh, we are uh, still finalizing the book with a collection of uh, different writers, including me and Sarah and other people, uh, going to have a 60, probably close to 60 articles uh, and uh, from different organizations and media outlets that will focus on uh, several issues. Uh, number one, and uh, uh, section one, we're warning from China, why U.S. is the sign of, then uh, and, uh, section two will be uh, called branding China why U.S. fell on fighting the COVID-19, not instead 
they just bring in China, China phobia. And section three, the spiraling disaster in the US, why the US COVID fight has been so dysfunctional, so disastrous, a systematic analysis. And then the section four, systematic US racism, racism and COVID-19. It affects every sector of the society, but people of color, African-American, Latinos, and many low-income family affect the most. And then uh, uh, section five, global aid from China. That chapter is uh, very interesting because most people did not know that China a COVID fight around the world since the virus, the, since Wuhan uh, has able to beat the virus and uh, turn to zero in China and on early on on early March they have been start sending aids and uh, medics around the world, over 100 countries and uh, international organizations. And last but not least, the section six, race for the vaccine, cooperation versus competition. Why China and uh, World Health Organization want to, uh, want this to be a, a public domain and uh, can be benefit around everyone around the world when U.S. and Trump regime is against the idea and want the, the U.S. to be a sole developer and a beneficiary on the vaccine development. So this is a very interesting book. We are aiming to going to publish this book maybe uh, sometime in August. I think this is the only COVID-19 books in just this category and also in comprehensive view talking about why China succeeds, why US fell, why international solidarity is so important versus imperialism is disastrous. So I hope this is a good book and we, uh, 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 if anyone interested and then uh, me and Sarah is talking about maybe we can do a pre-order and uh, so we can have a uh, uh, see how many people are interested and then uh, when the book published and then uh, those people can get it first so uh if anyone are uh, interested i don't know uh, sorry, uh what, how we're going to do it or either we're just going to uh people uh, send us some uh email or pay online and then uh, pre pre-order the books and then we can have some uh, uh initial order first thank you Okay, thank you so much, Suhen. And uh, yes, we will. Uh, I will say that everyone who has registered for these webinars, who signed up on uh, our mailing list, will get a notice and a special reduced rate uh, for this book because we want it as available as possible. And it also will have free uh, downloads um, on our sites. Uh, where you can download it in, in Kindle and uh, as an EPUB if you want to actually uh, get the printed book. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, events for that also. Then you'll, we'll tell you how to order it and how to get a reduced rate. So uh, look forward um, to it within the coming uh, month. But if you're on our mailing list, you will hear from us about the, about the book. Um, so now um, I will say that uh, there have been questions and I wanna ask um, if any of the panelists wanna particularly address one of these questions, you can do so by volunteering uh, and, and just jumping into the discussion for a minute. Uh, we wanna have time for uh, each person to, and I also would like to uh, answer some of these questions, but, um, of course, we're not going to be able to deal with them all, but they're they're worth dealing with. And I think that we also, as we said in the fact sheets and articles, have provided the background for almost all of these questions. But um, let me first ask the panel before I continue if they have 
uh, points that that they want to um, address in the questions that have come in. We'll just take a, a minute. Uh, and remember, you'll have to unmute and put your video back on. All right, you can't be shy. Uh, Okay, is that Calvin? Yeah, hi, I'm back. This is okay, Calvin. good. I don't have any other thoughts, but I'm here. So. Oh, all right. Uh, Monica? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to, there's been a couple of questions about the relationship between, um, you know, China and, and Africa. And um, I mean, you could almost do a whole webinar just on that. So this is not at all trying to um, fully answer that that question. Uh, we have written about it in Workers' World newspaper, but I will say that the main thing is that, you know, China has, has taken more of a, um, in terms of providing, um, you know, uh, you know, skills and, and, and so forth with, with African countries and not an exploitative relationship with Africa. It's been more of a pragmatic, I would say, relationship where, um, you know, China has been very supportive, for instance, in Zimbabwe, where, where they have provided, you know, um, uh, aid for the projects that the people of Zimbabwe, which very similar to, to China from the point of view of, you know, you have a large peasantry, a lot of uh, 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 farmers, uh, the, the economy in Zimbabwe is based, I think 80% of it is based on, on farming. And um, a certain, in, in the peasantry in Zimbabwe, a smaller uh, working class, and so there is a, a special relationship between Africa and Zimbabwe. And I think they've worked on, you know, uh, China has provided, you know, you know, skilled labor and also material aid in terms of projects like building dams and, and so forth with the people of Zimbabwe. So you don't have the same super expo exploitative relationship between you know, uh, China um, and, and the people of Africa who have suffered from so much uh, super exploitation, colonialization, neo-colonialism uh, from, from Europe. And, and of course with the US, with the, with, um, you know, the, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, the debt crisis, which Africa is, suffering, you know, in the billions of dollars, you know, um, in terms of paying back these, these loans um, that have really um, uh, set back development in Africa. So I would say that there is a more pragmatic relationship between uh, China and Africa. And, um, and this, you know, this needs to be studied more. Um, I would, you know, I just wanted to put that forth. And I do want to just say something. It's not a question I don't see, but um, I think it's important to, to reiterate that every struggle impacts another struggle, that no struggle is in isolation, um, no matter what the form may be. And I just want to raise this very interesting situation that happened in the area of mass culture when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement in China, and that's around the issue of sports. Um, there was an incident that happened a few days ago where this very, very ultra right-wing uh, racist um, senator from Missouri, Josh Harley, he actually came out and criticized the National Basketball Association for you know, for not coming out and, you know, the, the players are 
you know, they're going to be trying to finish out the season. And um, the NBA is 80% African American. So the players have a right to wear on their jerseys anything associated with Black Lives Matter uh, if they want. And so this senator came and came out and said, well, why aren't you, why is, uh, he's very, very anti Black Lives Matter. And he said, well, why aren't the players coming out in, you know, with shirts that say free Hong Kong or, you know, why is the NBA kowtowing to China, quote unquote. And um, one of the senior writers for the uh, ESPN, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, answered <laughs> answered the senator by saying "F you," and um, this became public. And um, and so he was he was uh, he was put on suspension by ESPN because he this was a senator and so forth. Not supposed to be political when it comes to ESPN. The largest sports network in the in the world, and what happened was was very interesting. Is that the players came to the defense of Adrian Wojnarowski, and um, and it's really because to make a long story short, it's because they felt that Wojnarowski was defending Black Lives Matter in his own way against this reactionary senator who has been very public against Black Lives Matter. So, and a lot of these players, um, you know, they, they have a relationship with China because the NBA is so huge in China and they have taken the stance of not interfering in the internal affairs of China, especially when it comes to Hong Kong. So I just wanted to raise that nowhere in the world can you, <laughs> you know, the impact of, of what's going on inside the United States with Black Lives Matter is, is definitely having an impact on international affairs, uh, like with China. And so it's something that um, it just shows growing mass class consciousness around this issue of white supremacy and, um, uh, and not being diverted away from that. So I just wanted to raise that point. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Important points. Uh, let me uh, answer a couple of technical questions that have come up. Uh, first of all, where would this be available afterwards? Uh, it is being streamed on Facebook and something that would be so helpful for you to do right after tonight's webinar is to go to Facebook and like the video there, share it uh, to friends, uh, comment on it, uh, and so on. That really helps. When I gave the example earlier about how one video, you know, had more than 150,000 views, we have to be our own media in many different ways. And that's something that everyone can participate in doing. So uh, check on Facebook. And also it will be uh, up as a YouTube video. You can check it on uh, workers.org, usually within two days. So what you're seeing now on the Zoom. So either way, uh, this program will be uh, available there. And, and usually on the Facebook stream, there, there are several thousand uh, views, people who are watching it right now, thank you, uh, and those of you who will check it afterwards. Um, that's an important uh, technical uh, question. I, we also, just to announce, uh, it was a comment in the questions, were asked to support peace activists in Hawaii who are campaigning to cancel the RIMPAC, those are U.S. military exercises that are scheduled for August 17th to the 31st. And uh, we do urge people to support that, and we ask the activists who are raising it to please send us information. We'll make a point of covering it and publicizing it uh, on the Workers World News uh, sites. Uh, this is in, important to do because this is a real people's effort against this huge military um, exercise, very much like what's going on right now in the South China Sea. Uh, I see a few um, uh, videos on. So if there's someone who wants to comment next, 
And, and then I think I'm going to uh, address, there's a question on the labor unions in Hong Kong. Um, and, and there was a, a, a question on Xinjiang. So um, we'll, we'll take, uh, if anyone, one of our panelists wants to comment next, uh, please jump in here. I think that is Dave. Okay, Dave. Yeah. And I wanted, see Su Hin. Okay. I wanted to uh, respond to one of the questioners uh, uh, who was pointing out that Cuba has offered uh, help, concrete help uh, in combating the COVID-19 virus. Uh, just as uh, when uh, Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, uh, the hurricane uh, and floods of Katrina hit New Orleans, uh, uh, Cuba offered help, concrete help, as they have helped with many natural disasters around the world and uh, sending their doctors all over the world to help uh, cure diseases. And um, uh, the United States rejected the aid of the Cubans. I mean, this is not, does not make any sense. I mean, right now, there's a number of people have offered their help, China included, help the United States to help deal with the uh, exploding pandemic here. And the United States has not taken them up on it. So this doesn't make sense. I mean, here you have some countries, these happen to be countries that are attempting to build socialism and they, uh, uh, they're, they're offering uh, in a generous effort to, to help uh, some of the harder hit countries uh, who are affected by the COVID-19 virus and the United States is refusing it. This does not make any sense, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Dave. No, it makes no sense. Uh, I think, Suhin, uh, you're next, right? Yes. Uh, someone was asking about should uh, U.S. activists support the Hong Kong Independent Union. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, I am born in Hong Kong. I was uh, in a labor movement in Hong Kong for close to 40 years. So uh, I know most of the labor organizers in Hong Kong. So I can say something very specific. That's the, the how big, the Hong, there's a big union in Hong Kong that represent majority of the workers is called the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. That is a left-wing progressive pro-China labor union, just like uh, AFL-CIO is umbrella of many unions in China, in Hong Kong, from uh, at different sectors. However, that is the one, that's the one U.S. does not support. U.S. does not, U.S. is putting all the resources against. Just, and uh, during the Hong Kong war, still the British colony between, before 1997, that the British Hong Kong colonial government has been against the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. That's the reason the coroners, the right wing, right wingers, the anti-communists in Hong Kong, they created the, another uh, union. It's, it's specifically to against the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. Another one is called Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions because the name is so close. People sometimes could be really confused. They both have uh, 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 unions and uh, uh, federation, all these things, but Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions are not the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions are the right wing, anti-communist, anti-China, and support by the U.S. and they are the one who call U.S. is called it an independent union because under the umbrella they create many proxy unions, uh, branch unions, and to uh, directly to in 
against the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. So that just to make it simple as speaking, it's a left-wing unions and right-wing unions, and right-wing unions are the ones who are supported by the U.S. and then endorsed and blessed by the AFL-CIO, specifically the Solidarity Center, who has been funded by the National Dem Endowment for Democracy. That is also the Cold War arm, and then also the one who have been involved in the uh, the uh, car revolution, exactly what have been happened in the Venezuela, the fake so-called trade unions against the Maduro's governments. That is the same thing if you want to make it simple to understand. So if I'm specific, more specific upfront to say there's no such thing as an independent union. Independent union in many countries because they already has a union. And then they said that independent union usually is the one who backed by a Western country funded by CIA or funded by the National Endowment for Democracy to against the already had the union which had the more progressive, more revolutionary, more grassroots. One more thing I need to also need to say, the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions, the right wing, has been the one main, for, main source behind the Hong Kong anti-government riot last year. They're the one who had been the the one who behind the mobilize and then all this kind of uh, uh, logistics support and then funneling money from US to Hong Kong to against the uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, provisional government and also on the same time also against the left wing Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. So that kind of things we got to understand. And then uh, I encourage anyone, if they say some things that independent union, you got to be very careful. That's there's no such thing as called as independent unions in many countries. And then if specific what U.S. said, what New York Times said, uh, you've got to be cautious. What Solidarity Center said, you've got to be careful about that. Thank you, Su Hen. I, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up um, with this just because um, it's that it's that hour. It is that time. I, I want to describe upcoming webinars, but uh, to close on saying it's this is where U.S. propaganda uh, to unions, the Federation of uh, in in Hong Kong and the Confederation, which was set up uh, really to counter. Uh, and, and is tied to U.S. money, the National Endowment for Democracy, which has nothing to do with democracy. And it's the same thing in Xinjiang. I think very important to look at. Uh, the U.S. spent four decades, that's not a short period of time, two generations, recruiting mercenaries um, in the most isolated and least developed part of China, in Xinjiang, which is now a crucial part in the uh, Belt and Road program, uh, but, but recruiting Uyghur mercenaries at very high pay into the war right next door in Afghanistan. And this was a US-Saudi Arabia project uh, and the idea of using it back against China. But the, the Uyghurs were actively recruited. There were 100,000 Uyghur mercenaries in Syria who fought with ISIS. That's not a small number. So this is a long-term project that went on to try to build a separatist movement to pay for it. Uh, and the support for this movement is really based in Washington, DC. And there's a lot of information uh, I could point to on workers.org, but I'd also suggest you check out Gray Zone uh, that has covered this extensively. Uh, by the way, earlier when I mentioned the Chow Collective, I really should have spelled it for those of you who are listening audibly, and that is Q-I-A-O, Collective. Now, as we close, I want to say these webinars are such an important way for us to connect that uh, our webinar next Thursday, that's July 23rd, is going to be a book launch um, for our new book that's just out. Uh, the China book is coming soon, but the book that is just out is called What Road to Socialism? And it's a Worker's World anthology with uh, some, a number of the leading Worker's World you know, thinkers and writers and journalists. Uh, all of the articles are from Worker's World. 
uh, and it is really talking about um, workers' struggle, revolutionary struggles versus reformism, uh, and looking at a social democracy and revolutionary politics. So I encourage you to tune in to some of the authors who will be describing what they were um, thinking of, working on, focusing when they were writing this. It came out just before the, the lynching, that brutal murder of uh, uh, George Floyd uh, and, and the uprising that, that, and yet everything in this book talks about the coming uprising. So come join us next week uh, for that. Uh, to say that the week after, let me just look at the uh, notes on this, which is the 30th, um, we have um, the, the Workers' World Party's Disability Rights Caucus will be hosting uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, a webinar uh, titled Smash Ableism, Racism and All Bigotry and Oppression and Build a World that Provides to Each According to Our Needs and Receives from Each According to Our Abilities. That is a tremendous slogan uh, from Marxism that is so well uh, put and important to remember in the struggle for people with disabilities. So that's the 30th. Um, just to say also on Thursday, August 13th, we will have a salute to Black August. So uh, tune in, uh, very much important uh, focus, the salute to Black August. Uh, I hope as you sign off, you will check out uh, this webinar on Facebook, share it and like it. You'll come back and check it on YouTube. You'll take a minute to subscribe online to uh, workers.org to get coverage. It really is a great source of news. So I encourage you, you'll get an email, not a ton of emails, but an email in your box each day of news updates. And if you're interested in building with an organization of both street militants and thinkers, uh, and so it's thinking and fighting, uh, then check out the joinworkers.org. So let me thank uh, Sue Hin Lee, Monica Moorhead, Dr. Sharat Lin, uh, Dave Welsh, and uh, Calvin. Um, for their contributions uh, here today and for the material that they brought. Night, build a worker's world.